Oh, look, it comes with a light as well. Isn't that nice? Um, uh, I want to use the taser to get it lit. I um, refer to this thing as a, as a taser because it's probably a similar technology. Oh, come on. I had it lit then. Right, there we go, it's lit. It is currently that many degrees. Um, although it was, uh, it was 16 degrees up in my room. So I woke up early. So I set my alarm, so of course my biological clock goes Oh, you've set your alarm to seven, are you? Let's wake up at six. So I woke up at six, and uh, yeah, very cold. As you can see, the remnants of last night's fire, it, it kind of just died out. I've got a log there, and it, sometimes fires, they, they will do that. They just peter out. I think I, yeah, I just open up the vents all the way. And, so I'm going to use a lot of kindling today. I'm going to use every stick I've got. And some more can be chopped up. Funny enough, it's easier to chop up the logs when they're wet than when they're dry. So I get some damp wood for my kindling and then I just... Uh, pack it near the main the main boiler so that they dry off <sighs> anyway let's get some heat because I is cold I is yep some heat and some more of the uh, leftover bean salad hmm <sighs> Maybe a headache pill? Oh, I don't know yet. And just take it easy today. I've done what I can with the car. I fixed the rattle, which is good. Yeah. Yep. Strange thing about COVID. Sweet and sour sicken. Is it really knocked my confidence back? I don't know. I was talking to my dad about it and he says, yeah, even the um Serum does it because uh, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but some people in my family take the serum, others don't. And uh, I've never had that from a cold or a flu or any other illness. I mean, even norovirus, which is very unpleasant, did not my confidence back. It just Maybe feel like, oh god, this is hell, and I'm really thirsty. And any time I try to take a sip of water, no matter how small, ten minutes later I'm vomiting it again. And again, benefit of hindsight. If you find you're afflicted with norovirus, and you've just been sick, and you're, um, uh, you know, you've got that horrible taste in, in your mouth that you want to wash it down with some water. Well, swirl the water in your mouth, but don't swallow any of it. You'll get some relief from just swishing it about. Probably absorb some water for your mucosal membrane. Um, 
but that way you won't have ingested any and anything and you won't vomit again because you won't be able to hold it down doesn't matter how first you are ah oh, listen to that you hear that noise that's that steam yeah, these are, uh, this is damp wood charcoal doesn't make this noise when you burn it But anyway, despite the dampness, can you see that? You see in the corner of that uh, that one there? Yes, that's moisture. That's being driven out. And likewise on uh, that one as well. So yeah, despite the moisture, it's, uh, it's burning. Yep. The main thing you don't want about, well, you don't want to be burning damp wood. There's two reasons. One, um, you're losing heat to cook the wood, basically. Um, so the heat, you're you're not going to get as much heat from it as you are from dry wood, so it's it's not as cost effective. And the other downside is um, that's putting uh, soot and creosote up up the uh, up the chimney flue, so you need to keep an eye on that. And when you get your strength back, do some chimney sweeping. Not right yet, but. I'll do it soon. Oh. The camera is a lot more sensitive to dust motes than my eyes are. I mean, people can talk about the romanticism of having a fire, and I do like it. It is nice. But one of the issues one must contend with is the fact that everything is dusty. It's all uh, dust and ash. you get a fine patina of grey ash everywhere. And uh, it's inevitable. But it's a necessary evil. And to think at one point, gas was just seen as a waste product of oil refining. <coughs> I remember in the 80s watching videos of um, oil bricks in the North Sea and going how do you build that and so that's why there's a documentary about how um, they build oil bricks uh, but then seeing these great big plumes of fire off in the chimney and I say why didn't they um, why don't they have a gas turbine that or like a steam power because they've got water around and well there's a couple of impracticalities as to the main reason they have that burn off is to uh, prevent pressure build up and uh, because you, you don't want your oil rig exploding that would be nasty for everybody involved and um, it's possibly too corrosive because it hasn't been refined. So if you did have a gas turbine, it wouldn't last very long. <coughs> um, excuse me. Oh, persistent cough. It's really, really is a nuisance. But yeah, eventually they said, oh, hang on, this isn't a waste product. This gas is actually quite useful. And one of the things I find surprising about it is um, burning it. Oh, well, I suppose that makes sense. If you're burning methane, it's CH4. Whereas if you're burning something like coal, it's mostly carbon with a little bit of hydrogen. So yeah, you when you're burning methane, you're... Um, you're getting uh, 
you're mostly burning hydrogen and there's a little bit of carbon. So for the same amount of heat, you get a lot less carbon dioxide as a result of it, which, as is the modern fashion, carbon dioxide is the only byproduct of combustion which we must be concerned about. So don't worry about sulfur dioxide or nitrous oxide or uh, the actual poisons. No, we need to be worried about this... I mean, if we're saying, oh, there's too much oxygen produced in this fire, people would go like, well, hang on, isn't oxygen what we breathe? But you see, carbon dioxide is one layer of abstraction from that. It's what the plants breathe. Now, some midwits would say, ah, oh, yes, but if there's too much of them, it'll be a runaway greenhouse effect. It'll be like Venus. Well, no, we won't. For a start, Venus has no moon. Secondly... <coughs> Venus has a retrograde orbit, and its um, its day cycle is longer than its year. Whereas on Earth, we have a rotational period, roughly 24 hours long, which does quite a lot to distribute the sun's um, heat all around. And secondly, nobody really knows how Venus formed. Ignoring the fact that Venus is closer to the Sun than we are. The formation of Venus, I mean, I even heard Manuel Velovkovsky saying that it is ejecta from the core of Jupiter and it, uh, it is a um, relatively recent object in, in the uh, solar system. And for that reason, it's still cooling down. And that would also explain its uh, dense atmosphere because Anything ejected from the core of Jupiter is going to have a, a dense atmosphere with it. As to how Earth was formed, I don't. Nobody's saying it's ejector of a gas giant. I've never heard any of those stories. So, quite different. But the other thing you could also argue as well is that <clears throat> when we had. The most amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, I think it was during the Carboniferous period, or the Creatoris. Some, some geologist in the comments will, will correct me. We, we had much more carbon dioxide. I don't want to say any numbers, because I'm no good at remembering numbers. Um, but significantly more than what we have now. Not a poisonous amount, just more. Because after a certain amount, carbon dioxide is poisonous. Um, and during that time, we had uh, no polar ice caps. And there were no deserts. And uh, this may seem contro controversial, controversial uh, to some. I mean, after all, isn't it supposed to be the hotter the things are, the more likely one is to experience a uh, uh, desertification? Well, um, plants, when they absorb water through them, look at all that dust, look at it. When they, um, ab when they uh, absorb water, no wonder my eyes get so uh, itchy. I'm just getting a patina of... Uh, Caustic dust. Hang on, then. What's that doing for my uh, pH balance? But anyway, transpiration. Plants absorb water through their roots. They need water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight. They also need oxygen, which is um, counterintuitive. Um, but anyway, they take the water up, and then it transpires through their leaves and becomes water vapour. And this is why phenomena such as the rainforest exist, because all the plants are acting as a giant pump, pumping water vapour up into the atmosphere. And then when it gets to night time in the Amazon, there is no longer the sunlight to sustain it in its vaporous form, so it precipitates back down and form rain, um, which continues the cycle. Now, it turns out... The more carbon dioxide there is in an atmosphere, the smaller 
the pores of the plant become um, what would that be? <coughs> Some botanists tell me why uh, plant pores shrink as the carbon dioxide concentration goes up. Well, anyway, they shrink down, and then uh, because the pores are shrunk, less water transpires up into the atmosphere. Commercial greenhouse growers, in order to increase yield, but also to reduce the water consumption, because if you're using water on the commercial scale, you have to pay for it, therefore you will use measures to mitigate water consumption. They'll have, um, they'll, they'll have just propane or candles, or they, they will have flamethrowers essentially in the greenhouse and at first I thought, oh, is that to keep them warm? No, it's not to keep them warm. Uh, as long as the plants don't frost up, they're going to be all right. No, what they're doing is they're increasing the carbon dioxide in... Because you can do that in a greenhouse. You can, you can carefully control the atmosphere. So by having naked flames inside the greenhouse, you increase the carbon dioxide... Uh, concentration so the plants have more carbon dioxide to grow with and then they transpire less water back into the thing now you could argue saying that oh in a controlled atmosphere environment like that wouldn't they wouldn't you be able to reclaim the water vapor that condenses on the window panes or the or the poly tunnels yes but not easily and um you're not going to get the benefit of increased CO2, increasing yields. So, it is cost effective to have flamethrowers in your large commercial greenhouse in order to increase yields. Now, taking those lessons on board, now I'm not saying we should do this, but at the same time I'm saying people shouldn't feel so guilty for uh, natural human endeavor let's face it all human endeavor involves fire so this this prehistoric thing here in its very domestic form human life wouldn't be possible without it i mean i'm i'm suffering at the moment because i'm cold which is why i'm wearing uh, my dressing gown <laughs> um evidence suggests that if carbon dioxide levels were to increase it could mitigate, not reverse, it could mitigate desertification. You need to do clever, you, you basically need human stewardship in order to reverse mitigation because you need people locking sand dunes in with uh, poverty grasses and using mycelium to build up actual soil. Oh, unable to use flash, battery power low. Right. Um, I'll tell you what. I'll do, a, I'll do a live stream tonight, possibly. We'll talk a bit more about desertification. Goodbye.